Good evening from, uh, from Hiroshima. My name is Mihoko Kumamoto, uh, Director of UNITA Hiroshima Office, and also UNITA's Division for Prosperity. Uh, welcome to uh, the Idea That Matter public session organized by UNITA and the UNITA Association. Uh, this uh, public session uh, is titled The 75th Anniversary of Atomic Bombing and the United Nations in the time of COVID-19. Where do we stand and what can be done for a nuclear-free world? Um, UNITA, uh, since 2015, has been organizing a training project uh, on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation in partnership with the United Nations uh, Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament for Asia and the Pacific, and also UNIDIA, United Nations Institute for Disarmament and Research, uh, thanks to great support from the Hiroshima Prefecture and the Hiroshima City, we would like to take this opportunity to express sincere appreciation for uh, everyone um, providing support. Now, um, as everyone knows, today is a very special day for, for the people of Hiroshima, not only for the people of Hiroshima, but for everyone in the world. This year, uh, 2020, marks the 75th anniversary of atomic bombing in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, this year also marks the 50th anniversary of NPT's entry into force. So this is a significant year. Simultaneously, uh, we are gravely concerned that security situation at the global level uh, are deteriorating. So uh, today uh, we have invited three, three great speakers uh, who are um, experts uh, on this important topic. Um, First speaker uh, is Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, Under Secretary General and the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. Um, since uh, May 2017, uh, she has many years of experience inside and outside the UN system on various topics, including refugees, migration, peacekeeping operations. Um, Izumi is joining from Hiroshima. Uh, welcome to Hiroshima and thank you so much for joining today's session. The second speaker is Mr. Tariq Rauf. Uh, he is former head of nuclear verification and security point at the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA in Vienna. Uh, he was also senior advisor on nuclear disarmament to the chairs at the 2015 NPT Review Conference and 2014 NPT PrepCom. Uh, he was also long-term expert with Canada's NPT delegation until, until 2000. And since 2015, uh, Tariq has been the lead resource person for UNITA's training on nuclear disarmament and non preparation Tariq is joining from Vienna today. Thank you so much, Tariq, for joining. Our third speaker is Ms. Victoria Krop. Um, she is intern at Ant Hiroshima, which is one of the most active uh, Hiroshima-based local NGOs on this topic, nuclear disarmament and non-preparation. Uh, Victoria is a master degree student in peace studies and international politics at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, welcome, Victoria. And thank you for joining. Uh, before we start, uh, we would like to conduct a quick poll for the audience. Uh, so uh, um, we are going to ask you questions. Yuko-san, could you uh, put the questions? Thank you. So we are asking these three questions. The first question, have you been to Hiroshima or Nagasaki? The second question, do you feel that you are familiar with key issues surrounding nuclear disarmament and non preparation And the third question, are you optimistic about the realization of a nuclear-free world? Uh, please answer this question now. Okay, so uh, right now uh, we, are, uh, we have 85% result. Uh, so uh, let's have a quick look. So. Uh, 
it seems a majority of the people have been to Hiroshima or Nagasaki. That's, that's fantastic. That's great. And do you feel you are familiar with key issues on this topic? Um, more people say uh, you don't feel uh, familiar. 58% uh, of the people said that. Um, and the third question, are you optimistic about the realization of a nuclear free world? Uh, it's wonderful. 66% of the respondents say yes. So uh, thank you very much for this, uh, this uh, for answering this question. Now uh, we will move to the main part, uh, but before that, there is one more thing. We have received a video message from the governor of Hiroshima, uh, Mr. Hidehiko Yuzaki. So uh, we are going to play his video message first. Good evening from Hiroshima. I'm the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. Hidehiko Yuzaki. I'd like to start by thanking everyone around the world who is at the front line to fight human crisis the world faces, including the pandemic, racism, inequality, conflict, and violence. 75 years ago from today, the people of Hiroshima went through a human tragedy far exceeded 100,000 lives, including children, women, and old, perished. Hiroshima was burned to ashes. The message from Hiroshima to the world, we shall never make the same mistake, is more relevant and important than ever. In 2020, international security situation is deteriorating rendering nuclear threat the highest since the Cold War. We stand at a historic moment. The only way forward is to learn from history and work in solidarity to shape a better world. I'm excited to cooperate with United Nations, all member countries of the United Nations, and NGOs for the coming years to eliminate nuclear weapons. I hope that today's webinar will provide everyone an important opportunity to reflect on the atomic bombing of Hiroshima 75 years ago and renew our commitment to create a nuclear-free, sustainable, and peaceful future. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Now, um the first question, uh, so uh, uh, before that, this uh, public session is divided into two parts. The first part is going to be a dialogue among uh, the speakers. And then the second part is going to be Q&A session. Now, uh, for this uh, public session, we have asked uh, the participants to, to give questions during registration. So uh, we have uh, compiled those questions and we are going to ask these questions to the speakers. Uh, now, the first part, so um, uh, I would like to now uh, turn to the speakers. Uh, well, firstly, uh, what is happening at the global level, uh, negotiations, uh, discussions uh, for nuclear disarmament and uh, non-proliferation? And firstly, I would like to focus on what is happening and what are key challenges we have faced. Uh, and firstly, I would like to ask uh, Izumi. Uh, Izumi, uh, so uh, today, uh, Secretary General um, has released a message, and in his message, he said, "A world without nuclear weapons seems to be slipping farther from our grasp." Uh, so, considering that, how do you see the current situation? What are key challenges we have faced? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mihoko. Thank you for that question. Um, well, challenges, there are many. Um, as, um, as you quoted the Secretary General, um, we are very concerned about where the world is going, um, which is basically about the deteriorating security environment. Not just the, the environment is deteriorating, I would say that international security environment is also profoundly changing and evolving. 
Um, let me just uh, go through key points of deterioration and challenges, the, 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 uh, the, the, the issues that are really worrying us at the United Nations. Um, as you can easily imagine, one of the biggest challenges uh, is that um, um, the relationship between those great powers, nuclear weapon states in particular, uh, seem to be really deteriorating. There are a lot of rhetorics. Uh, they, are, they seem to be um, uh, no trust and no confidence. They seem to be really a lack of dialogue amongst them and between them. Um, they are indeed talking about uh, increased role of nuclear weapons in nat their national security doctrines. Um, so all these things combined, um, we are concerned that the risk of nuclear detonation is really dangerously high at the moment, highest since the peak of the Cold War, that is the previous Cold War. Um, at the same time, um, as you all know, uh, the international regimes related to nuclear weapons is uh, starting to erode or in some instances uh, already collapsed. Um, you know about the INF Treaty, Intermediate um, uh, um, Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, uh, ended its um, effect last year in, in August. We are now focused on, um, on our efforts in terms of uh, convincing US and, and Russian Federation for the extension of New START Treaty. Um, so one by one uh, regime, the treaties agreements uh, that have been actually maintaining international stability and security um, is um, eroding uh, and collapsing in front of our eyes. And, and that is really a problem. Um, we also see very practically that uh, all nuclear weapon possessing states are investing huge amount of money in modernizing nuclear weapons. They're also investing in new types of military technologies. Um, and all these things also combined, we are starting to say that international community, the world is starting to, to see a, a qualitative um, arms race uh, dynamics. In other words, going backwards uh, from disarmament path. Now, turning to different regions, um, in several of the regions, uh, we also see increased uh, nuclear weapons proliferation risks, Middle East, uh, South Asia, also in this part of the world, Far East, uh, Asia. Uh, they are very complex, um, all the new tensions and historical conflicts, some of them combining also um, uh, involvements uh, of great powers, uh, very complicated regional conflict and tension dynamics coupled with nuclear uh, proliferation risks. Um, finally, uh, we are also beginning to see um, uh, new, completely new types of technologies, rapid development of science and technology, cyber security, AI, artificial intelligence, outer space, new types of missiles, all these new technologies also beginning to be looked at uh, by many militaries. Uh, so all these things combined, I said that uh, we are going through a profound changes and evolutions in international security. This means that so-called um, strategic stability that has been basically maintained by nuclear weapons, strategic weapons, are also beginning to be impacted by new types of weapon tech, potentially weapon technologies. So we're looking at potentially a very new uh, security dynamics around the world. Uh, all these six things combined, um, I, I think you can understand that we have many, many challenges around us, uh, especially when it comes to nuclear uh, weapons. Thank you so much, Izumi. Thank you. Now, I would like to uh, ask Tariq uh, to share your thoughts. So, uh, Tariq, uh, you, are, uh, you have been one of the leading experts uh, on this topic. Uh, so, uh, I uh, would like to hear from you your thoughts on key challenges at the global level. And also, particularly, the world is, has faced COVID-19 uh, additional um, pandemic, uh, pandemic threat. 
So how is it impacting uh, the negotiations? Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Mihoko, and I would like to start by thanking you and UNITAR for organizing this commemoration event uh, webinar. I really appreciate the, president, uh, the presence of uh, Under Secretary General Izumi Nakamitsu, the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs at the United Nations. And it's very important to hear the voice of the young people. So we have Victoria Krupp, uh, who is the hope for the future uh, to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. Hopefully in her lifetime, it doesn't appear to be at least in my lifetime, unfortunately. Um, so I would like to start by saying that up until now, Hiroshima and Nagasaki mercifully remain the only instances in which nuclear weapons have been used in war. However, it has been the hope that the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki serve as a constant reminder why preventing the further use and proliferation of such weapons should be of the highest priority and why nuclear disarmament leading eventually to a world free of nuclear weapons should be the goal for all international organizations, for people, and especially the youth. In this regard, I would like to recognize and greatly appreciate the decades long efforts and sacrifices of the Hibakusha, their families, the children, the people and leaders of Hiroshima Prefecture and Hiroshima City, to keep alive the memory of those who perished and sustain those who survived the atomic bombing 75 years ago. This honorable and selfless example of the leaders and people of Hiroshima should be an inspiration for the people and government of Japan, as well as for those in other cities and countries globally to resolutely strive to seek a permanent end to all nuclear weapons. It is truly inspiring that Hiroshima Prefecture Governor Hidehiko Yuzaki continues to be a tireless staunch supporter of achieving a world free of nuclear weapons. And Hiroshima City Mayor Matsui Kazumi also is working towards this goal. And the mayor of Hiroshima is also the president of Mayors for Peace which encompasses 7,909 member cities in 164 countries and regions which can to convey the realities of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The unfortunate SARS coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic has clearly and unambiguously shown in my view, misplaced priorities and misplaced investments of trillions of dollars by the axis of nuclear armed states and their allies. This historic severe underinvestments in healthcare have led to the unacceptably high levels of infections and fatalities in most of their countries, which is very unfortunate. It is also tragic that in some of these states, they are now selfishly commandeering medical supplies and instead of collaborating internationally to jointly develop a vaccine some countries are engaged in bitter competition and propaganda that amounts to vaccine nationalism or vaccine tribalism of my country first. And it should be remembered that one cannot protect one's own country from a pandemic if the pandemic is alive and well in other parts of the world. This is not surprising because just as the advocates of nuclear weapons and deterrence have lacked the mental acuity to comprehend the global catastrophe of any use of nuclear weapons, they also fail to understand that defense against a pandemic cannot be contained within any one country, just as the effects of a nuclear war cannot be contained in any one country. It is obvious that those non-nuclear weapon states that did not waste national resources on nuclear weapons or foreign military interventions are the ones that have been coping much better uh, with the pandemic. Now, as um, Izumi mentioned, and as you also mentioned, Mihoko, the message from the Secretary General of the United Nations, unfortunately, the vision of ridding the world proceeding as a nuclear arms control architecture that was patiently built up over 50 years is collapsing. And as Izumi pointed out, doctrines of some of the nuclear arms states now posit first or early use of nuclear weapons. For example, in June of last year, the United States Defense Department issued a new nuclear weapons guidance, which called for using nuclear weapons in order to create conditions for decisive results and restoration of strategic stability. 
For its part, the Russian military doctrine envisions what some have called escalation to de-escalate. That is to use nuclear weapons to counter superior NATO conventional forces. In South Asia too, India and Pakistan have been engaging in saber rattling over the past year or so. And it's highly disturbing that when nuclear weapon use is discussed, the vocabulary used is often very conveniently sanitized. The destruction by thermonuclear war and resulting humanitarian and environmental consequences are downplayed and substituted by antiseptic concepts of nuclear deterrence. And finally, for this section, former US Defense Secretary William Perry has just published a new book called The Button. The button refers to the button that the leaders of nuclear states have and that they would push the button, so to speak, to launch their nuclear weapons. He has said that our, in his view, the United States nuclear weapons policy is obsolete and dangerous. I know because I helped to design it and we have to change it before it is too late. And Secretary Perry warns that the awesome ability to launch hundreds of thermonuclear weapons in mere minutes creates grave dangers of blundering into Armageddon. And unfortunately, there is now reluctance to reaffirm the understanding that was reached in the mid 1980s between Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev that a nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought because now, as I just mentioned, there are scenarios uh, in some nuclear armed countries uh, which envision the use of low yield or tactical nuclear weapons in what they call a limited war context, which in their view would not create too many collateral uh, damage or casualties, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tariq. Uh, now I would like to come back to Izumi uh, to share with us what opportunities well, we are seeing now. Um, and, uh, uh, UN uh, Secretary General Disarmament Agenda uh, that was issued in 2018. And in this agenda, uh, nuclear weapon is uh, uh, disarmament uh, and non proliferation of nuclear uh, weapons is disarmament to save humanity. Now, uh, if you could share with us what progress uh, we are making um, according to this agenda, and also any other opportunities you are seeing on this topic, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Over to you, thank you. Okay, let me start with opportunities for nuclear disarmament because there are a few. Um, people must have been uh, very uh, depressed about all the challenges uh, around us uh, because the, the trend is actually going backwards from nuclear disarmament. But I can guarantee that there are some opportunities. Um, the only thing is that we have to take advantage of those uh, opportunities. The first opportunity, of course, is the, uh, the review conference, the 10th review conference of the NPT. Um, that was supposed to have been NPT Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, this year, 2020, uh, is the 50th anniversary of its entry into force. Um, so we, are, we were very much hoping that uh, from, from April to May this year, uh, there will be a 10th uh, review conference and then taking advantage of that momentum of a 50th year uh, anniversary, uh, we will have a successful uh, outcome uh, from that review conference. Unfortunately, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, forced us to, um, to postpone that uh, review conference now tentatively scheduled for uh, January next year, remains to be confirmed. Um, obviously, we, we have to make sure that it will be uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic will be under control uh, when we have that very large conference. Uh, there are about 1,500 people who will be participating in, in such a conference. But this uh, MPT review conference will be a very important opportunity. Uh, for all states parties of the MPT to come together uh, and uh, first and foremost uh, reaffirm, uh, hopefully at a very high level, uh, reaffirmation of their commitment to the treaty. Now, MPT has been one of the critical pillars of international security. Um, so we very much hope that all states parties, in particular nuclear weapon states, will come 
come to this uh, review conference and, and we confirm their commitment, full commitment to the treaty and the obligations that they have undertaken under this uh, treaty. Um, and also second, it will be a very opportunity for states parties fought. They don't have to, you don't have to use the exact uh, words, but if countries can come together and, and return to that logic, uh, it will be very important. Um, a third, there are actually many pragmatic and practical steps to reduce the risk of nuclear detonation. I spoke earlier about the challenges, and I said that the risk of nuclear detonation, whether that is by miscalculation, um, um, et cetera, uh, intentional or miscalculation or by mistake, uh, the detonation risk is highest since the, the height of the Cold War. But there are, in fact, many pragmatic steps that countries can take to reduce that nuclear risk. Um, and the MPT uh, review conference will be an opportunity to discuss and agree on those uh, risk reduction measures. No one, no countries want to have a nuclear war. Uh, and therefore, we need to take advantage of this opportunity and then agree on risk reduction measures. And there are many practical things that we could, we could discuss and, and, and do. Um, and um, um, I also add as number three, um, I talked about science and technology development. Um, one very important thing that we need to acknowledge is that um, challenges to non-proliferation are not static. There are many new and emerging uh, challenges, and therefore um, this uh, regime called MPT cannot be static either. Um, if they can actually acknowledge that, then uh, in the future, perhaps in five years from now, the, at the next review conference, uh, they will be able to, in fact, discuss measures um, uh, to tackle emerging, new and emerging challenges to the MPT. And, um, and finally, um, I think um, everyone would agree that uh, nuclear disarmament and arms control will need a new vision. Many things around the world have changed so dramatically, uh, which means probably that disarmament and arms control uh, will have to have some sort of a new approach or new vision. Um, and I'm very much hoping that the 10th review conference, whenever it would take place, uh, will be a first step, uh, if you will, a springboard uh, for states parties, for international community to uh, start acknowledging and then addressing uh, those new visions uh, that is uh, required for the international community. Now, another opportunity is the TPNW, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, the Secretary General today said in his uh, uh, message, video message to the ceremony, that he is uh, looking forward to the entry into force of this new treaty um, and because it will become a, a very important additional pillar of nuclear disarmament regime uh, and that will give us additional momentum um, from non-nuclear weapon states obviously um, that uh, we have to return to uh, a, a vision, a collective vision of uh, uh, world without nuclear weapons. Finally, let me just say that I would like the international community to turn the COVID-19 crisis pandemic as an opportunity. Um, it has given us a lot of lessons. Uh, one of the lessons uh, is that a previously unthinkable situation can actually happen and it can happen very rapidly. Um, I know that it is very difficult to imagine a nuclear war starting in the 21st century um, in front of our eyes, um, but pandemic has happened. Um, so the only way to uh, make sure that such a risk uh, would now actually become a reality is to eliminate the threat and the risk itself. So let us apply that lesson to nuclear disarmament issues. The second lesson, is the importance of placing human beings at the center of security. 
um, we, you know, we have seen or we're still seeing that invisible virus has put the entire world into this state. So let us go back to the uh, original uh, uh, security um, um, requirements for each and every individuals that are living in the world, which means that human security has become much more important. Um, very practically, I also think that um, because of the pandemic and, and the, the need to recover from this pandemic, many governments around the world will not have um, an enormous amount of financial budgetary resources to be spent on military. Um, and therefore, they will return to dialogue and negotiation-based uh, security. Uh, I hope that there will be a, a moment of opportunity, window of opportunity opening up to encourage uh, states parties or member states to return to a dialogue-based security because of the need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Izumi. Uh, I would like to turn to Tariq now. Uh, Tariq, uh, would you like to add anything else in terms of opportunities that the world is seeing? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm glad that um, Under Secretary General for uh, Disarmament Affairs, uh, Izumi, is uh, optimistic because uh, if she became pessimistic, then we are all truly condemned. Um, I have a slightly different perspective, and that is not to disagree with her, uh, but basically to try and motivate and incentivize uh, countries and civil society to work harder uh, to try and achieve our common goals, the ones that were just mentioned uh, by uh, Izumi. Uh, the NPT, as you mentioned, Mihoko, marked its 50th anniversary this year. Um, but unfortunately, things in my view are not looking very good for the NPT context because states really have walked away from previously agreed commitments from successful conferences in 95, 2000, 2010, where we did agree on a number of risk reduction measures, on measures to reduce the risks of nuclear weapons, to bring in more transparency and accountability with regard to nuclear materials and nuclear weapons, but that has not happened. And actually, and modernization programs of some of the nuclear weapon states have created new risks. So it's a little bit like asking people who are drunkards who have been drinking even more to stop uh, and be grateful if they drink less. So we really need to work harder that they actually stop doing this activity, which is a threat not only to them, but also to the rest of uh, humanity. Now we do have a number of competing approaches uh, on the table. So for the non-aligned movement, they for a long time have called for a three-phase uh, plan of action uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons. Many of the Western states have had what's called a step-by-step -step approach and this was modified by another initiative called the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative, NPDI, which uh, talks about building blocks that we, just as we build a house, we move to its nuclear disarmament step by step by building new treaties, such as a treaty to prohibit the production of a fissile material for nuclear weapons and, and so on. Uh, there is the new agenda coalition. Uh, they had an uh, approach called taking forward uh, nuclear That was, as uh, Uzumi mentioned, uh, the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Last year, Sweden, with 15 other countries, came up with a proposal called Stepping Stones uh, to Nuclear Disarmament. And now also there is from the United States a proposal called Creating the Environment for Nuclear Disarmament. This last one, in my view, is quite problematic because uh, the CEAD approach, creating the environment for nuclear disarmament approach, is actually putting the onus for nuclear disarmament not on the nuclear weapon states, but on the non-nuclear weapon states, that you help create a world where we, the nuclear armed states, do not feel threatened so that we could consider uh, nuclear disarmament. One hopeful development is that in, on the 22nd of June and also on the 27th of July this year, uh, the Russians and the Americans met here in Vienna, and they started a new series of discussions. In my view, it's called the NSVT, Nuclear Space and Verification Talks, where they are 
discussing these three baskets of issues, nuclear doctrines, arms control in space, and also transparency and verification. And we have not heard any press releases about discourse. So because there is silence, I think we can be hopeful that the two sides are making some progress. Um, Izumi mentioned the Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons. Uh, this uh, was approved by 122 states in July 2017, which is a majority of the member states of the United Nations. So if we talk about uh, democracy, then here a majority of the member states of the UN have already told us where they want to go. 40 states have ratified. We need only 10 more countries to ratify this treaty. And I think we should use this opportunity of the 75th anniversary to encourage more countries to ratify this treaty so that we can establish when this treaty enters into force, what we call an international law, a Jus Kogan's rule. That is the fundamental principle under international law, which would create what's called an erga omnis. That is an obligation for all states to renounce nuclear weapons. And therefore, I think this is something that Japan as a victim and on the 75th anniversary, I think should recommit uh, towards this particular goal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, we would like to talk about efforts being made at the community level. Uh, and now we have Victoria, uh, representative of the future uh, generation. Uh, thank you so much for your patience, Victoria. Uh, so if you could share with us uh, why you decided to come to Hiroshima, what you are doing uh, with Aunt Hiroshima, and what are op uh, challenges and also opportunities you are seeing to disseminate the message of Hiroshima to the world. Thank you. Over to you, Victoria. I chose Hiroshima to learn more about the history of Hiroshima because at school I only learned about the atomic bombing as an historical fact. So it was like during the Second World War, the air bombs were dropped and the war ended. That was all. And at university, we focus more on current civil wars. But I wanted to learn more about how the people in Hiroshima rebuilt a whole town after the atomic bombing. How does Hiroshima look like right now? How does the past affect the current life of the citizens? And as a German, I'm interested in the situation after the atomic bombings, because during the Second World War, Germany surrendered before Japan, and Germany surrendered later. Probably Germany would have been a target for the atomic bombings. And for the challenges we are facing, I think for local organizations, one of the most challenges is that the atomic bomb must be more than only one historical fact in world history. It must be more than just an information. Knowledge alone isn't sufficient. A lot of media and historians tend to view the victims as statistics. They discuss a huge number of dead, but rarely focus on the human element. People understand and emphasize better when they can picture themselves in an event, and having the individual perspective is important for promoting this. Let me tell you an example. I translated the testimony of the survivor Numata Suzuki into German and sent it to my father for proofreading. Ms. Numata and her father worked at the same office. After the aid bomb was dropped, her father searched for her. Her father was unharmed, but when he found his daughter who had lost one leg, he felt desperate and was crying. While reading this, my father imagined that he would be in the position of Numata's father after the atomic bombing. My father imagined how he would search for me and began crying. It's important to find those emotional connections between the biographies of survivors and us. In the example, it was a social role as a father that had a strong impact on my own father. When people read stories with strong feelings, it will have more impact than just reading a sentence like, many thousand people died. All the people who died and all survivors had their own life before the atomic bombing. They all had people and other things that were precious to them. And they are more than just the number. And another challenge that is connected with the first one is still the lack of foreign languages, especially minor languages. Of course, my father learned English in school, but he doesn't need it in his daily life, so he forgot a lot. He himself wouldn't read an English text if he doesn't need to. So with translations, people can read primary sources about the atomic bomb or about survivors in their own language. 
Otherwise, people without English skills wouldn't have the chance to learn about Hiroshima, and the people in Hiroshima wouldn't have the chance to tell others about the city, the history, and the experience. English is a foreign language for many people, but materials in the mother language are easier to understand, and we can convey deeper understandings, emotions, and nuances that we need to not only share basic information or statistics or numbers, but to really reach the heart of people. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you. Now, uh, just a follow-up question. What opportunities are you seeing uh, at the community level? One opportunity I see, especially right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, is digitalization. All around the world, organizations are offering online meetings and online workshops because face-to-face -face activities are difficult. One example is right now this webinar. So usually only people with a lot of money have the possibility to go to Japan, to buy flight tickets, and to go to Hiroshima. With online formats, it is possible for us to reach people we haven't reached so far. So for example, an organization in Hiroshima called Peace Culture Village started with other organizations a project to offer live tours of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, Peace Memorial Museum on Instagram. So without going to Hiroshima, the people could see the exhibitions of the museum. And another opportunity is right now this year's anniversary. Usually anniversaries like the 25th, 15th or 75th are more in the national, international media than other anniversaries. We can use this year's anniversary to emphasize our messages. So even though there are restrictions for activities due to COVID-19, the world still looks at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, especially this year. Great. Thank you so much, Victoria, for sharing your thoughts and experience. Thank you. Now, um, we, we would like to uh, hear more from the speakers, but uh, considering the time constraint, I would like to move to the second part of the public session, which is a Q&A session. Uh, and uh, thank you so much uh, for, for those, uh, those of you who uh, have sent a question to the speakers during the registration. Uh, so uh, we have a, a long list of questions, uh, actually, and thank you so much. Uh, from here, we are going to pick some questions. Unfortunately, we will not be able to cover all the questions, uh, but thank you so much. So the first question is regarding commitment and actions of nuclear power states. Uh, so uh, here is a question. We haven't really seen actual commitment or actions from uh, nuclear power countries and relationships between nuclear giants are getting worse. What can political leaders uh, do to break this stalemate and move towards a world without nuclear weapons? Uh, and uh, particularly relationships between the US and China uh, seem to be deteriorating. So what can be done? Uh, I would like to uh, hand this over to Izumi first. Uh, Izumi, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. It is indeed a, a central part of the challenges, I think. Um, there are several things. Uh, first of all, um, we have to consistently and, and jointly, collectively uh, encourage and, and push those big powers to return to dialogue. Um, as the question says, the, the relationships between nuclear weapon states um, is definitely deteriorating, um, but we need to make sure that they also understand the responsibility as nuclear weapon states. Now, there is one thing, one uh, historical fact about um, previous Cold War. The nuclear giants that are, of course, um, uh, the United States and the Russian Federation today and previously Soviet Union, during the previous Cold War, U.S. and the Soviet Union understood that special uh, responsibility as nuclear uh, superpower. Um, we have to make sure that this message uh, is consistently uh, um, conveyed to these two countries. Uh, today, still more than 90% of nuclear arsenals are held by the United States and the Russian Federation. And as such, they do have a special responsibility. 
um, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, uh, of course, increasingly, uh, the United States and China um, seem to be um, 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 heating in, in, in terms of their uh, rhetorics. The, the, the relationship between the two countries are also uh, deteriorating um, publicly. Um, the same thing again here. Um, we need to make sure that all other countries uh, send consistent message and encourage them um, to have dialogue and negotiations to resolve their differences. Um, and, um, you know, the, the message that we need to, um, to, to convey to all nuclear weapon states must be that um, uh, arms race uh, dynamics, if you actually are continuing to invest so much uh, uh, financial resources into developing and modernizing nuclear weapon states, um, that will have negative implications in the end on their own national security. Um, and again, this lesson was indeed uh, understood uh, during the previous um, um, Cold War. Um, you know, many people say that uh, when the tension is increasing, it's not possible to have arms control and disarmament negotiations. That is historically not true. Um, MPT, um, you know, this year is the 50, uh, 50th anniversary of its entry into force, which means that it was negotiated and agreed upon in the height of the Cold War. Um, many of you will know that in 1962, there was something called Cuban Missile Crisis that was probably one of the closest points uh, the world has become um, to uh, a new actual nuclear war. Uh, only a year after that Cuban Missile Crisis, there was something called Partial uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty also agreed upon. So um, historically, um, countries have been able to discuss and negotiate arms control and disarmament agreements. Uh, and that is precisely because these measures help increase confidence um, you know, when they have a skeptical um, skepticism um, against each other, uh, these dialogue and negotiations uh, will increase confidence and therefore uh, it helps their own national security. So we need to make sure that this message is consistently sent to those big powers. And United Nations is definitely continuing with that, uh, with the help of, I would say, many of you and other UN member states uh, sending the same message to those nuclear uh, weapon states. Thank you. Thank you, Izumi. Uh, now, the next question is for Tariq. Uh, so uh, the question is, how can we abolish nuclear weapons uh, while uh, the world, uh, many parts of the world, keep operating nuclear plants? Um, so uh, over to you, Tarek. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, usually in the discussions on disarmament, sometimes people link nuclear energy with nuclear weapons. There were 10 countries that developed nuclear weapons. South Africa is the one that renounced its nuclear weapons uh, unilaterally, and now we have nine. Each of these countries had a dedicated nuclear weapon development program. Nuclear power plants are under International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards. Uh, we have uh, 30 countries with uh, 450 nuclear power plants. About 20 are under construction. About 10% of the electricity generated in the world comes from nuclear. So if we are to meet the sustainable development goals and also in particular uh, climate goals of reducing uh, greenhouse gases, then nuclear has to continue to make a contribution along with renewable energy sources, solar, wind, uh, so that we are not burning coal, oil, and gas, which is creating problems for the atmosphere. Uh, of course, we need to make sure that nuclear energy and nuclear materials that are in use are under verification and are not diverted from uh, peaceful to military uses. Thank you very much, Tariq. Thank you. Uh, now, the next question, uh, this is for Izumi. Um, and here is a question. 
Uh, even if nuclear weapons are abolished, eliminated, uh, there will continue to be other types of weapons, including conventional weapons. Uh, so what do you think about it? Uh, does it make a difference to eliminate nuclear weapons? Over to you. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, nuclear weapon is uh, a category in itself. Uh, it is unique because of its uh, destructive power. So as such, um, you know, you must have heard the terminology weapons of mass destruction, WMD, in shorthand. Um, the reason why it really should be eliminated uh, is because um, the kinds of devastation that nuclear weapons can cause uh, is quite different from other conventional weapons. Uh, of course, other types of WMD, uh, there are two categories that have already been uh, um, uh, banned, um, prohibited. Um, chemical weapons has a chemical weapons convention that prohibits, um, you know, not just the use of it, but also production and, and the possession. Uh, same for uh, biological weapons. Um, so um, we have to make sure that uh, we treat and we understand and we treat the, the special uh, uh, category of weapon called nuclear weapons. As many people say, if there are two existential threats to humankind, um, one is of course the climate change, uh, the other one is the, uh, the nuclear weapons uh, uh, use. Um, so um, it, in, in our view in the United Nations, it will make absolutely sense to make sure that we um, collectively move towards the elimination, total elimination of nuclear weapons. And that is still today a joint uh, um, uh, objective or joint vision uh, held by the entire, United, uh, entire uh, um, international community. Now, this said, it does not mean that we should not pursue other um, regulation uh, other disarmament uh, measures of all or other uh, weapon types. And we are indeed uh, prioritizing all these uh, conventional small arms and light weapons, uh, explosive weapons used in populated areas. Um, we have all sorts of other new types of uh, um, potential weapons, uh, lethal autonomous weapons, uh, the cyber uh, security issues. So indeed, the UN uh, also pursues other types of disarmament, uh, regulation of other types of weapons, uh, elimination in, in certain, uh, in some cases uh, as well. Uh, but the nuclear weapon actually falls uh, in a very unique category of, of weapons. Thank you, Isumi. Now, the next question is for Victoria. Uh, so, Victoria, so here is a question. Uh, I believe this person is a teacher um, or someone working for a school. Uh, every year, uh, students from uh, inside and outside Japan come to Hiroshima or Nagasaki uh, to listen to the stories of survivors. However, now uh, it has become very difficult, almost impossible because of COVID-19 and also survivors are aging, uh, so uh, uh, physically difficult. Now, uh, under against this background, backdrop, uh, how can we continue to disseminate message of Hibakusha survivors to uh, future generation children? So what is your thought? Over to you, Victoria. Thank you. That's a really good question. So my thoughts are that we should read a lot of about the Hibakshas, about their lives before the atomic bombing and after the atomic bombing, especially after how they rebuilt their new life, how they are living now and stuff like that. But it's not only about reading or like only visiting Hiroshima, going to the atomic bomb dome and then just going away. So like knowledge alone won't stop a war, knowledge alone doesn't help others or won't stop other countries to drop another atomic bomb. So it's more important than after you gained your knowledge to talk with your family and friends about those issues. Or if you are a teacher, 
or an, another educational instructor to talk with your students about this, talk with them, discuss with them, discuss with people. And especially when you are, can't right now going to Hiroshima directly, just see about testimonies that are online, videos that are online from, for example, from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, Memorial Museum or stuff like that. They offer various materials in English and Japanese and um, another thing that everyone can do, even students or teachers, is like, for example, share news and events from organizations that aim for a nuclear ban on social media accounts. Or there are also accounts that share those experiences of hibakshas. So those actions only take a few minutes, but everyone can do it from everywhere. So these are, I think, the important thoughts on this question. Thank you so much, Victoria. Now we are getting close to the end of this public session. Uh, so I would like to ask each speaker uh, to say any message you have for, uh, for the participants. So let's start with uh, Tariq. Uh, over to you, Tariq. Any message to the audience, please? Thank you. Yes, I think we all need to now redouble our efforts to work for what we would call a right to nuclear peace and to prevent nuclear weapons from becoming a perpetual menace. When the Pope visited Hiroshima last year, he declared not only the use, but also the possession of nuclear weapons to be an immoral crime. And I think the leaders of other religions like Islam, Judaism, and others should also join the Pope in issuing a united call for the people of the world that we need to move away from nuclear weapons by 2045, which would be 100 years since the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and the invention of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tariq. Uh, Victoria, uh, any message to the audience? Uh, thank you. My message is please take action for the nuclear ban on the local community level. Start today and tell others about what you learned at this webinar today. Probably a lot of people don't know about those issues Talk today. Let the people around you know what's going on in the world and what you can do. Thank you so much, Victoria. Now over to you, Izumi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, basically the same message. When things are difficult, that's exactly when we have to redouble or we have to tenfold increase our efforts. Um, we cannot um, give up. Uh, and, um, um, you know, live in desperation or, or disappointment. And that's exactly when we have to um, organize ourselves, become smarter, identify strategies, and, and, and take joint actions. And here, I would definitely like to emphasize the role of young people. Um, when I see, um, actually, um, these uh, past, let's say, two years or so, um, Me Too movement, Fridays for Future, and now Black Lives Matter. Um, young people getting together, um, creating, um, you know, using the technology, social network, uh, etc. Um, sending the message that enough is enough, we need a change. Uh, it has actually created tremendous energy, a tremendous force for change. And um, those messages are now starting to really reach policy makers. Um, so we have to make sure that young people are able to, um, you know, use their creativity. They will be able to innovate. Um, they have uh, um, enough opportunities, sufficient opportunities to equip themselves or arm, arm themselves with um, knowledge and skills that they need. Uh, I do believe um, the, the changes, the transformation uh, is possible. And I would like that uh, similar kinds of transformation happening uh, in the uh, uh, understanding of security around the world and, and resulting in uh, reversing the current trend um, in disarmament movements. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, all the speakers uh, and the participants. Uh, at the end, we would like to conduct another survey. Uh, Yuko-san, would you be able to pull the poll questions? 
Great. So uh, we would like to ask you two questions. So um, after the participation of this public session, do you feel that you have a better understanding of key challenges and opportunities on nuclear disarmament and non-preparation? And the second question, are you optimistic uh, about the realization of a nuclear free world? Okay, it's over 80%, uh, close to 85%. So uh, uh, the first question, um, close to, well, actually, yeah, over 95% of the, the people felt uh, you gained a better understanding of the key issues. Uh, that is wonderful. And the second question, 81% of the people are optimistic about the realization of a nuclear-free world. Thank you very much for your participation uh, in the poll. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the th uh, three speakers for, uh, for joining this public session and sharing your extensive knowledge and experience through the public session. Thank you so much. I would like to conclude uh, this, thank you. Uh, I would like to conclude this public session with uh, a remark from France, uh, Pope Francis uh, during his visit to Hiroshima. He said, let us open our hearts to hope and become instruments of reconciliation and peace. There will always be uh, possible if we are able to protect one another and realize that we are joined by a common destiny. We live on the same pl planet, so we need to join forces and realize a world without nuclear weapon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, and have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.